wrong. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta stop making predictions. I know, I you're guess. always wrong. <laughs> That's not true. Uh, okay. <laughs> I was one third correct. How so? Well, my prediction was that Trump was gonna lose. Sorry, Trump was gonna win. Mm hmm. The Democrats would take the entire Congress. They took half of it. Well, they maintained the House. But okay. The Senate is still, we don't know. It depends well, so on I'm Georgia. So I'm at least one third correct. Because, you know, that. Well, the last third is unknown. Right. <laughs> okay, so, yes, you're one third correct, one right. third incorrect, and one third to be determined. Yeah. <laughs> I'll take it. Yeah. <laughs> Whatever. This is why I don't make predictions, especially when it comes to um, sports games and yeah. stuff. I'm just... <laughs> well, in movies. No. Unless you cheat because and look, I look it, up. it up. Yeah, we covered that in the, yes. on another episode. But when you legitimately try to predict what's going to happen in a movie, you're almost always wrong. I'm pretty good at it. Welcome to <laughs> While She's Napping. I am Adam. And I'm Cindy. Okay. Uh, I want to get all the pleasantries out of the boy. Go for all it. All the... Uh, you know, the, the foreplay, if you will. Okay. <laughs> I just want to thank everybody for listening. Yep. Um, last week's episode was very, uh, the engagement was pretty good. And obviously people want, the, the number one thing on people's minds, I think, uh, almost if not entirely around the globe, um, was the presidential election for the mm -hmm. United States. And the numbers that we have in our statistics bear that to be true. So um, rather than just go through the list right now, not because um, I'm not grateful for the listens, but I, I kind of want to get this episode underway. Sure. Um, so thank you for everyone that has listened thus far. Thank you for everyone that has been participating and sticking with us throughout this process. We weren't planning on doing this as a topic. Because right. I think there was a sense of doom and gloom, obviously verbally from me mm -hmm. last week, that we thought, and I think you did too, intrinsically, um, not intrinsically. Um, what, Subconsciously? Yeah, whatever. Um, internally. Sure. That's the word I'm looking for. <laughs> internally. Um, you thought Trump was going to win. And if Trump was going to win, we obviously didn't want to talk about it. Uh, yeah. I don't think I wanted to, I, I'm, I would have rather have it gone this way where I was prepared for the worst, but hoping for the best yeah. kind of thing. I, I don't didn't think wanna, you were the only one. Yeah. I mean, I had hope. I was hopeful from what I was seeing um, and the networks that I've been involved in and knowing how much was going into it. Right. Um, but I, I refused to be blindsided like I was in 2016. I get it. So that being said, thank you for everyone that has listened thus far. If you like this episode and you're interested in hearing more, please subscribe to the show on your favorite podcatcher. And if you can, leave us five stars and a quick review on Apple Podcasts. We'll leave it at that. Um, so let's just jump right in. As of today, which I want to say today is November the 8th, 8th. Mm -hmm. Joe Biden is projected to be the president-elect of the United States. Mm -hmm. It's weird because, you know, we talked about how uh, my voting process or lack thereof has been. <laughs> Your voting history? Yeah, yeah. For the past two years, sorry, two terms, and, uh, or two elections. And, you know, even though we live in the small state, I think our electoral college counts as one. Four. Four. Jesus. <laughs> I have a lot to learn. Civics. Um, <laughs> we had, Side note, we had a listener suggestion that we cover civics as a topic. Oh. It's very broad. Okay. But I think we're, yeah, it's... it's. If you haven't realized why we shouldn't. <laughs> right. <laughs> no, but I think if we're so obviously not experts, but I think it'd be an interesting, like, just... Uh, showcasing an average conversation between average people sure. who went through the American, you know, public education system and oh, what yeah. we do and don't know about civics. Everything. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> but anyway, that's for another day. Yeah. Um, 
you know, th- in the previous election, I was voting because I thought I had uh, somewhat of a moral obligation towards mostly you to <laughs> not have Donald Trump in office only because, and I've openly admitted this before, I haven't ever really had an interest in politics and largely politics has not affected one way or the other my life. If anything, it's always on the positive side, no matter who's in office, just because of the yeah. the lottery in terms of genetics that I've hit, just a uh, white male right. in America. So the the impact on these things directly to me has never been felt one way or the other. Um, so now going through four years of Donald Trump, it was way more than that uh, in terms of ha- needing a reason to vote. And, you know, given the fact that Rhode Island only has four electoral college votes, I knew we were going to swing blue anyway. It didn't matter. But for the first time in my life, I feel like I'm a part of something politically. Like, I feel like no matter what or how minuscule my vote was and how it ne- didn't necessarily sway anything one way or the other it feels as though it matters it does matter you should feel that way i mean in the grand scheme of things of rhode island it doesn't matter yeah but imagine if half of the democrats in rhode island or unaffiliated or independent or whatever thought that yeah our state would turn red i get it I get it. I mean... It's just, it, I feel part of something. Well, and regardless of what the the ultimate outcome or the ultimate effect is, or no matter where you live, it's still, it's your civic duty and people who uh, aren't like you... That, pe- that's, what do you mean? That's, I feel that in this country, you have a freedom to not do things. Sure. But I feel like as it's... It's a way of being a responsible member of society, in sure. my opinion. Okay. To, to take the time to be educated enough to make an informed decision on who is going to lead our country, our state, yeah. our town, your community, um, and recognizing that that decision may not directly impact you based on your demographics or your age or your race or your sex, but that it does affect our community and our country and our society yeah. as a whole, and that's really important, and you should use whatever you have to make a say in that. It just ver- uh, validates, rather, democracy. Mm-hmm. And I know the election process this sh- time, this, I was going to say this term, but this time, mm-hmm. um, was a little funky. Um, I am not good with being behind in terms of any races. <laughs> um, this mimicked, much like a fantasy football week for me where <laughs> on a Thursday I'm down by a lot mm-hmm. and then but the projections are still like it's okay it's looking okay it's, <laughs> Keep you might fight. win <laughs> yeah. but my numbers are in the red yeah and my opponents are in the green and <laughs> it just looks bad yeah like I started my kicker and he got two points <laughs> and Sunday comes around and I'm, okay I'm doing okay and then Monday I have one guy that I need maybe five points to win the game and he goes off and he goes off for 40 <laughs> yeah <laughs> and that's it so Thursday night I'm super down Tuesday morning I'm oh playing Taylor Swift on the way to work <laughs> we've been playing a lot of uh Taylor Swift the yeah. last couple of days um that you know Tuesday night going to bed Tuesday night I felt exactly the same way I felt in 2016. And I was like, it's happening again. And I, I think didn't everybody sleep. did. I know. And I, the thing is, I had prepared myself for that. I had prepared myself knowing what we know about the patterns in mail in voting. And this has been discussed a million times on a, many platforms, but it didn't matter. I knew that there was going to be um, the in person voting on election day was going right. to skew towards Trump. And I knew it was going to take more time to count the mail in ballots. And that they were ultimately going to skew towards Biden. But it, I just had so much trouble keeping the faith on Tuesday night. Um, I mean, Florida was the first state, the first battleground state to be called. And it went to Trump pretty easily. 
and very quickly. Right. And I was like, oh, here we go. Well, I think he did a good job. He being Trump did a good job of trying to stake his claim in election night um, Mm -hmm. traditions, quote unquote. And, you know, anybody can say, oh, the election is never really known on election day. I can't remember an election, maybe Bush and Gore, but I can't right. remember an election where we didn't know late that night or the next day. Right. And but the even thing though is, it's unofficial. Exactly. Because the states all have different timelines for when they actually need to officially certify right. their votes. Um, and they're all over the place. I don't, they're like into December. I think some are even into early January. But. It no, doesn't matter. Uh, I don't know about that, but sure. Maybe. Whatever. I yeah, I'm not sure. I just know that all the states have a different deadline yeah. for when they need to certify the votes and it's never November 3rd or November 4th. Mm. Well, I shouldn't say it's never. I don't know that for a fact. But point is it's never official certified on election night. Right. So that whole rhetoric of we need to know on election night is it's really interesting because in 2016 I don't remember anybody saying oh well wait it's not official when Trump won no, we on knew. election night we knew it was over. I know but technically the votes weren't certified so to use that as an excuse now doesn't make any sense to me I think it's because we're so used to that we're so used to things being unofficially official either guess, late that night or early the next morning right and I think Trump took advantage of that took advantage mm-hmm. of that familiarity that we have in terms of an election and was banking on, incorrectly banking on, um, people not really waking up to the fact that we have these mail-in ballots. And, you know, maybe people were under the assumption that some states had already counted them in addition to what was coming into the polls. So that's what it was looking like. Right, some um, states had, but some states weren't allowed to start counting until election wasn't, day. Um, right, which is, was a big one. But I think that is the sense of anxiety that a lot of people had, especially if you went on Twitter. And I know it's the bane of these things, but um, a lot of the people that I follow from Canada, they were, like, "What the fuck are you guys doing? What are you doing?" And because the the red mirage, quote unquote, was heavily favored to Trump, mm-hmm. and you know, when you hear, th- and, and I'm a pessimist by nature, you know this, when you hear things, especially coming from the opponent, you know, keep the faith, keep the faith. I'm just, yeah, everyone says that when they're losing, man, you know, like that, that doesn't yeah. necessarily mean anything to me until you start seeing things turn around. And it sucks because in the morning, I was ready to give you the same sort of speech I did last time. Oh, you did. You came in the room and Wednesday I said, I'm morning sorry. and you apologized to me. I was like, what happened? How, what? But you were the one that kept saying it's not over. I, I said, how do you know that? And you said, it's just, he's winning. It's not looking good. It wasn't. And I know, but we knew it wasn't going to be looking good. And I kept saying, they're not done yet. They're only like 60% in Pennsylvania or whatever. And it was yeah. leaning red, but yeah. I the was still was a mess. <laughs> the momentum was amazing. You mean in the whole election? It just process? the 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 quick turnaround. Oh, within from the, the Wednesday, week. yeah, onwards, right. was ridiculous. And you had different uh, news outlets and media sources having different tallies, yeah, for both pres- uh, for both candidates, I should say, um, and just trying to figure out. Well, why did Fox call Arizona? Why did the AP call Arizona? But NPR is not well, NPR yet doing that. NPR follows the AP. Okay. The well, same. then it was yeah. ABC. Which yeah, is, yeah. CNN, you know, I don't think, had called it. No, or no, no. No one else had called it. Was, it was, I mean, the AP, I, I learned this recently. The AP has not been wrong yeah. since the 1800s or yeah. something like that. It's, I, my understanding is that that's the, like when the, the AP standard. calls it, it's yeah. over. Like that's, yeah, that's what I was watching. Right. So, look, it, it's it's proof of democracy. It it actually unfolds, and maybe I'm just saying it because my guy, quote unquote, won. No, that's not why you're saying it. I think I think that has a lot to do with it because democracy also sort of won in 2016 because the 
the majority of the people in those states that yes, those, in those swing states right. made the difference. Yes, but I think that this can be viewed as more of a win because at least the Electoral College aligned with the popular vote. And the popular sure, vote yes. was even more that the margin was even was almost double what it was in 2016. So Clinton won by like two million something votes, I think, sure. in the popular vote in 2016. And Biden, I think that he's projected to win somewhere between five and six million. He is the most voted for president or candidate ever. Mm hmm. And did you see Trump's tweet? Yeah. It's 71 like, million. I'm the most. I'm the yeah. most voted for sitting president ever. And you still lost. Yeah. I'm <laughs> saying that's like winning the fucking toilet bowl in fantasy football. <laughs> no one brags about that. Right. Who cares? Right. Um, so it makes me wonder whether or not there's going to be a sense of, you know, unity as a, as a result of this. Because, you know, we talked about this before about how the responsibility of the pandemic, sometimes you got to let things take a back seat or rather you have to let your emotions and your desires of things take a back seat and look at the bigger picture of the pandemic. Certainly that wasn't demonstrated yesterday, but I'm sort of sympathetic towards it. Well, yeah, no, I, I, you see some of these large gatherings and everything, but I mean, the, the, obvious difference is that the vast majority of people participating in these celebrations are wearing masks. Sure. I should note we're recording this Sunday evening. So yesterday mm -hmm. is when uh, Biden was announced as the president elect. And we're, we're seeing all these crowds in New York City. Outside too. Outside. Yep. Sure. Um, Philadelphia, Washington, D.C. Um, celebrating the win. And you know, on the one hand, I'm thinking to myself, Ooh, these numbers are going to spike up. This is not good. That's yeah, it's what not I've great. Been... It's not great for COVID. No, and that's what I've sort of been trained to think now when yeah. I see big crowds. Um, but on the other hand, I'm I'm legitimately legitimately saying to myself, I think we needed this pass just yeah. for today. And even though the numbers are going to go up, and it's probably irresponsible if you look back at it in hindsight, I think we need this pass. Yeah, I think there's it's not just about winning this election. And like what I was saying before, that it's not just because our guy won. It's not it. it I think it is. It's it's it was. So. I think what everybody wanted to see was this landslide, like no questions asked. We are not OK with what has been happening the last four years. This is not what our country stands for this does not represent our values as americans and we are not taking this shit anymore do you mean immediately like the results of the election i think that at least people on the left i think really wanted to see that like you don't think that was demonstrated so i'm getting there oh, all right. <laughs> they didn't want it to be close they didn't want to just edge them out yeah, they yeah. wanted to just like no doubt yeah, blow out blow out um like complete repudiation yeah. of everything that it stands for um, and I think the narrative has been because it was so drawn out over the last week and because there's all this like nitpicking about fraud and the, you know, dead people voting and all this like dumb shit <laughs> like right. that that is taking away from the fact that even though our country is obviously divided and 70 plus million people still voted for Trump, this was a blowout. In that, like, if I feel like if we had had these results on Tuesday night of a five million vote difference in the popular in vote the popular, and a 306 yeah. electoral college, it, which Georgia still has to be called, but if Biden ends up getting Georgia, that's 306 electoral college votes, which is what Trump had in 2016. And right. he called it a landslide. Right. And he and he lost the popular vote by two million. So to say if Biden wins the same number of electoral college votes as Trump did in 2016 and wins the popular vote by more than twice as many as Clinton did in 2016, that's certainly a landslide. Yeah. But it has it, it can't look that way because it was drawn out. And the re only reason it was drawn out is because certain states weren't allowed to start counting their ballots right. because of lawsuits that Republicans started. Mostly his uh, base pushing for it. Right. But I, I got to give a shout out to people, it, judges, 
even some Republicans, you know, in Congress or whatever, really just in in a roundabout, implicit way, just saying to Trump, shut the fuck up. Yeah. And just not buying it, Mm -hmm. not feeding into it. And the only people that are really feeding into it is his base which in comparison to the rest of the country is rather small. And I Mm -hmm. don't consider the 70 plus, the totality of that, the 70 plus million that voted for Trump as his base. Right, right. right. I would say the hardcore base of that, you know, or the hardcore members of Team Trump probably represent less than half of that 70 million, I would think. I would yeah. like to think. Right. I'm sure there are plenty of people who voted for Trump who aren't in this moment. Hardcore Trumpers. Right. And are probably wishing that he would just give a concession speech. Yeah, and they believe the results. And believe in a peaceful transition of power. And they don't want this mess for the next two months. And right. as much as it sucks that they their candidate didn't win, I think that they still believe in our democracy and they're not buying into the conspiracy theory stuff about right. the voter fraud. And they would like to move on. Right. <laughs> Yeah, that's what I'm I'm thinking. I agree. I I don't I think the majority and I think that's gets back to what you're saying about I'm really seeing this as an opportunity for for unity because I feel like the last few days and maybe it's just because I have tunnel vision or it's because of the circle that I live in. I don't know, but I feel like it really is the minority of people who are really digging their heels in and saying, no, it's not over. You just wait. We're going to, you know, keep up with the lawsuits and you'll see the truth. And there were so many illegal ballots and all this stuff. I feel like those people are really few and far between. Yes. That's what I think And that gives me hope. Yeah, I think so too. And I just got to give credit to everyone that's not feeding the beast because I think that's what he's used to. I think he's right. used to people feeding into these false narratives and conspiracy theories and wiggle room for ways out. And right? it's just not gaining traction this time. Right. And mm-hmm. people are, are, are just smartened up to it and they just don't want it. They don't want any part of it because it's, it's time to move on. And unfortunately, we're going to have the risk of every four years. Is he coming back? Is, are his kids? Gonna yeah. try to come back or something, but what gives me sort of reason to cast that aside, um, especially when it comes to his children, and in a way, maybe when he gets reintegrated into his old life, he'll realize I really missed this. I really missed my old life where I'm not put under a microscope all the time. I'm not being dissected all the time because think about it: before he was president. I don't know, and before he, you know, launched his campaign, I don't know anybody that was like, fuck Donald Trump. I think he was just this... He was just another, like, media personality, whatever. Yeah, like... And he was probably well-liked by the layman, just they know his name. I remember... People probably thought he was a jerk from his time on The Apprentice. Like, that was part of his persona. Yeah, entertainment. Right, that's his character. Yeah, Yeah. but I don't think beyond that, anybody really had a strong opinion of him, even though he did have some shady things in his past. I just don't think... But I don't even think people people knew knew about about it. it. Right. Right, it wasn't... That's what I'm saying. Common knowledge. I think, obviously, he can't unring a bell. He can't go back to those times, but I do think that there will be a sense of once he goes back to fucking more. I don't know. I don't think he's going anywhere. I don't know. I, 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 I maybe not immediately, but I don't think his kids want that. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what to say to that. I don't. Regardless. I mean, yeah, I feel like they thrive. I don't. I. That's they're the, an the embarrassment flailing, now. I know, but the the flailing nature of what they're doing right now of trying to like scrap together any possible thing to keep themselves in the spotlight and to, you know, not be, not have to admit defeat. It's just the level of narcissism is off the charts. When the vast majority of the American people and not even Fox news is feeding that beast anymore. I just don't know where else they're going to go. What do you do as as someone who 
if if you're what if you're someone who has relied on Fox News and I know someone personally who said this to me one time that Fox News is the only media channel that tells the truth. It's the only one that will give you an unbiased opinion or an unbiased picture yeah. of what's happening. If you're one of those people who have followed Fox News like that and it's kind of what has contributed and maybe, you know, the person doesn't realize this, but contributes to the why they have the opinions they have and why they support have supported Trump so um in such a dedicated way these last four years. How do you deal with this how right now <laughs> how do you reconcile that Fox you listen is... to only hannity and tucker so now it gets narrowed down even more yes to only believing the people who fit your yeah worldview yeah i don't i can't wrap my head around that because that's that's you just you just Their cult is you that's... just abandon the thing that you took as being gospel for the last four years because, no, because all it's of a still sudden fox news right but not all of it sure like you would have never questioned it before right but in <laughs> fairness chris wallace has true yeah you know backfired against trump and well it's not the first time that fox has fox has reported things uh contradicting trump or against trump or kind of like borderline in the past but it's it's not very often and it's not very severe but i think they have to to try to appear to be at all like a, a genuine media source yeah you know and it's not just that what are what are the QAnons doing and that's a genuine question. They're what? saying, you just wait. You're going to see something the likes you've never seen before. Okay, what's Q saying? <laughs> I have heard that there's not much, but I don't know cause because I don't follow Because this, so, <laughs> this is so shocking, I feel. to th- if, if you're the dude or a person uh, behind Q or the group of people behind Q. You mean JFK? Yeah, sure. <laughs> JFK Jr. Sorry. Um. And and you're willingly fucking with people because I would assume that's what Q is doing. I, I imagine Q being a, a person or a group of people behind a desk being like, I'm just going to try this, see if they believe this and just put out some nonsense <laughs> and watch them connect. You don't think it's someone who really dots? believes all this? No. You think it's someone spending this much energy and time and yes. just, just messing with people? Yeah, there was a study about it because it makes that person money in terms of advertising revenue and website clicks. Yeah, but no one like knows that. who they are. So how are they make? Well, how do they make money? I, I don't know. There was, there's a whole article about it that certain there's revenue funded from this. I don't know. Bitcoin or something? Sure. I don't know. But my point is, is it's. How can this person really believe it that's posting it? Because we're really supposed to believe that Q has this high um, ranking. He's a high ranking mm-hmm. official with all access to these. Yeah, high security clearance. No way. There's no way. I know. <laughs> because these things don't make sense. So I imagine it's in reality someone or people trolling these yeah, probably. stupid people that are buying into it and. They're just watching them yeah. sort of connect non-existing dots. And so now they're saying, what the fuck do we do? I think that, so I think because, and I have, a, I'm literally basing this off of one account that I see every now and then, um, but there's a, there's definitely the religious connection. We talked about that yeah, during sure. talking about QAnon. And I think it's just God knows the truth. God will, will put things right. Keep your faith, yada yada. Sure, and January twentieth, and that Trump we'll is still the, is still God's chosen child. Oh, <laughs> like stuff That's like funny. that. Yeah, yeah. Um, the ultimate twist is if Q said, "Actually, Trump is the pedophile. He's the one." <laughs> There's no way that would <laughs> it's just like the ultimate oh, M because Night he's Shyamalan. trolling them. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the ultimate M Night Shyamalan yeah, twist. Yeah. And, and then what do they now do? Now the country is legitimately unified. Right. Because they just, yeah. they're, they're behind Joe Biden and we got to get that guy Trump. <laughs> well, we already got him. I'm just saying. Yeah. It's, I don't know. Someone's got to check on these people. <laughs> I know. Someone's got to make sure they're They're okay. just in denial. That's what it is. Before we head into our break, I do want to say that this does sort of give me hope now in 2021 for something at least 
I don't want to say somewhat positive, but we have a, a linear path yes. towards progress now. And I, I will say that the, the election of Joe Biden is so off brand for 2020. I know. It does not right? seem fitting. I know. That's why I think going into the election, part of me was like, well, it's 2020. So how could anything good happen? Right. Like, <laughs> and then the another ultimate 2020 uh, fucking with us. We had an earthquake in Rhode Island yes, today. A 4.2. <laughs> and we thought it was a truck driving. Yeah. By. I thought there was like an 18 wheeler going through right. our neighborhood. And I looked out the window and didn't see a truck. And no I truck. was so confused. Yeah. 2020 is just it's not done yet. All right, let's pause right here, take a break. Um, When we come back, I want to jump into um, conversations about the speeches, and um, I want to finish it off with Trumpism in general and whether or not we'll see the last of it. So hang tight. We'll be right back. This is, I want to get into Kamala's speech first because, I mean, I can't speak to this. I can only speak to it, obviously, the father of our child uh, being uh, a female. Um, I'm sure this is meaningful for you as a female and as a mother of a female um, to see not just a woman, but a woman of color and the direct child of an immigrant um, having the vice presidency now or will in January. And, you know, depending on what happened, I don't want to throw this bad voodoo out there, but she, we're talking linear paths, whether it's during his presidency or not, she's could be, if, if we're talking about how things go, next in line for mm-hmm. presidency eight years from now four mm-hmm. years from now it doesn't matter yeah she's next in line you got to figure that of the democratic nominees obviously joe biden aside in the future who's most likely to run it's got to be harris now of course yeah i mean she ran this time <laughs> you know she no no, no def- i know but now she'll have her feet on the ground absolutely in the White House. she'll have experience yeah yeah, this is on the job training. So yeah, I just I don't know if you want to speak to um that the, the female aspect of this for a lot yeah, of Yeah, well, way to I put mean it. in general as far as what it means for for me as a parent is I mean not just not just Harris and the significance of having um a woman in the White House, but just having this ticket win at all. Um I was just terrified for, and I know, I know that there are people on the right who will call me a snowflake for saying that. But um, when it comes to some, like, and I said this before in our uh, pre-election episode, that just having, like you said, we feel like we actually have a vision. Like, there's a, there's a light at the end of the tunnel right now. Like, there's yes, there's a plan. We know there is going to be a plan for covid to deal with the pandemic and there's going to be hope that and tangible goals that we are working towards to get it under control so that our child can have a more normal life Quicker. and we don't have yes like she's in her like you know she's missing out on time with her relatives and her friends and her cousins and the fact that i feel nervous about sending her to daycare which we love where she goes to to daycare and 
but it, there's just so much anxiety around every single thing, like yeah. not being able to take it to the zoo, not being able to go to you know public playgrounds, whatever. Like they sound trivial, but that's what makes a childhood, right. you know. And I was We're just fortunate that she's young enough that hopefully she won't remember this exactly. But if another four years had happened, right. she would have been, and that right. would have been her formative years. And I was not okay with that. That thought just yeah destroyed me. Yeah. So that's the from the COVID perspective, but also the climate perspective. We talked about this like she's of the generation that if we don't do something right now, like we are out of time to plan for climate. And if we don't do something right now, her generation is not going to have a world like we know it in her adult life. Yeah. Like she's not going to be able to to have children of her own. In a, I really feel like that, like in a comfortable way to be able to live in the way that we do with the resources that we have. And so that was also terrifying to me. Um, and again, that's something that I know the Biden administration is going to take action on. Alre- they already are. Right. Like, So those were the two big things from my perspective when it comes as a parent that I was afraid about. Um, and then having the fact that there's a woman on the ticket and going to be in the, in the White House. Normalizes it. Yeah, it's like... I had this realization that I, I don't think I let myself think about it too much beforehand because I didn't want to be like even more disappointed and despaired if it sure. didn't happen. But reflecting on it now that it's happening and after watching her speech yesterday, I was like, my daughter is not going to know that this isn't normal. That like I, she yeah. will like she will understand, you know, she'll learn in school in, that this in, was the probably first in hindsight. Yes, she, she that it was historical. It's kind of like how we think. I feel like it's I, like in relation to um, the civil rights movement and racial justice. I feel like growing up, I viewed that as history. Right. We learned about the civil rights and it wasn't from my perspective. And I realize now that there's it was sort of a mirage. It was quote up. unquote fixed. Right. Like. Right. I couldn't imagine a world where like people were outright racist and black people didn't have the same rights that we did and they couldn't vote and things like or had to use a different water fountain or a different go to a different school like that to me felt so foreign and obviously in reality there was plenty of issues the remaining um but that was I didn't know a time where it was as extreme as it was back then sure and I feel like that's sort of similar to how she's going to view that. She's not going to know a time where it was so unprecedented and it was so abnormal to have a woman in this position. It's mm-hmm. just going to be what she grows up seeing. Hopefully. Hopefully. Right. For the next four, eight years. However, if Kamala, you know, becomes president after that or whatever happens, or if it just opens the path for more women in our government, like right. our child's going to start seeing that and seeing people of color and people of different religions Right. It, it's it's that's just going. I feel like she this has opened the door for her to have a chance to see a government that actually represents our country. Yeah. And that's huge to me. Yeah. And, you know, I don't know how calculated this was. And I'm not trying to take anything away from the decision. I think she's more than qualified. Um, I said just based on I've liked her before this. Mm-hmm. And I've said that to you. Um, and again, like I've as said, a senator. Or just as a candidate? As a person, as a candidate. I, I remember the, the initial thing that hooked me. I, to, I said, mentioned this on the previous episode was she's into Kendrick Millar. Uh, I'm sorry, Kendrick <laughs> Lamar. Yeah. And I was, okay, that's weird for a politician to be into modern hip hop. And then you get to know her and her policies and her stances on things and how she's from Oakland and, you know, just her, her position and how she handled things in California. I'm just... So you just relate to her as a genuine human being. Yes. Yeah. And that, I'm sure there's yeah. a political side to her that's... Well, she's got a... She has a um, complicated history sure. as a prosecutor None and of all that. that. Matters. And I'm sure it's... I don't want to say calculated, but I'm sure there is some sort of calculation by Biden said it would be really advantageous for me to not only have a woman as my vice presidential candidate, but also a woman of color. Mm -hmm. That type of thing is not lost on me that. But I also think Biden was genuine in saying, I think this is actually a good thing for our country. So I'm I would like to find a a candidate that fits that bill. And I think early on he knew that would have been Mm -hmm. Kamala. And I think she knew it too. Um, 
Well, he even he said it in his speech. I mean, he. I think he point knew. blank he pointed out that the black community has supported him throughout his career, and right they um and that black women have really been the backbone of the Democratic Party for quite some time. And that's not lost on him. And he was even he mentioned um, transgender people right. in his speech. And I think that's the first time a president has or a president elect has ever mentioned transgender people. It's just the level of inclusivity. Yes. That was highlighted in that speech. Well, we'll get to that. Yeah. Well, let okay. me let me get to <laughs> Kamala's first. And I think this is the point of emphasis I want to I want to mm-hmm. make here by what has been. And I stand on their shoulders And what a testament it is to Joe's character that he had the audacity to break one of the most substantial barriers that exists in our country and select a woman as his vice president. But while I may be the first woman in this office, I will not be the last. I think that is what put her over. That's a line that got me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, something about it gives me, I don't want to say hope because that seems so tacky, but just comfort in knowing that this is now normalized and it, it ought to be. And... She's right, and obviously she. It, there was a tongue-in-cheek aspect to the Joe had the audacity. That means mm-hmm. to the system, he right. had the audacity to choose someone like me, or obviously, mm-hmm. you know, her, um, for this, for this position. I I don't know this this whole thing is almost near perfect because you have a relatable person. That I would like to have been this sort of, uh, I don't know, the position that she's in being relatable or relatively relatable to millennials, um, being on the same wavelength of what things ought to be, you know, legalized like pot, like, come on now, this is something that should have been legalized a, a long time ago, and she's for it, Um you know, at healthcare, being on the same page of people in in our demographic that Joe Biden might not tap into as mm-hmm. well. I think it's very advantageous for him to it's have balanced. someone. That, that's a huge age gap. Yeah. And I think it's advantageous. Whereas someone like that, I feel, would have made a, a great president. Mm-hmm. And the reason why I say this is near perfect, because although I'm happy Joe Biden is president, I just wish it was not because I'm worried about longevity here. I know we talked about that before. I just wish it was someone younger. So not only do we have a vice president that relates to us, but also the president. But um, I I like the happy medium of representing both demographics. Yes, Biden represents extensive experience. I mean, he was vice president for eight years. And I mean, Kamala has experience too, but in in different ways. And um, yeah, I think... This administration is being, um, you know, I've heard that the character is it's being characterized as one of the most um, collaborative. Like it's like when you think about Mike Pence, like and maybe because I'm not a Republican and I haven't been super engaged and I don't know enough about what he's doing. But it's they talk about Trump. It's Trump. It's not the Trump Pence administration. It, this is so Biden Harris. Like, I feel like it's not just the campaign, like, slogan or campaign, you it's, know, it's a collaborative the, effort. Right. And I think it will remain that way throughout his presidency. I believe it too. And that's pretty unique, I think. Where Trump just wanted to find someone that will kiss his ass and be the yes man. And that was Pence. Yeah. But not even just Trump. I feel like throughout at least my lifetime thinking about previous presidencies, I just don't remember the vice president being highlighted in the, the way that. Harris is now and having it be viewed as uh, such a collaborative effort. I mean, Gore. Gore with Clinton. Was I guess. I mean, I was pretty young for that. So I, I, I have a pretty limited view because of my age. <laughs> and the dude that was with Bush. Yeah, again. Cheney. Uh, 
Chain, oh. that was collaborative. He's, the only thing I remember about him is that he didn't he shoot someone in a hunting accident? I think so. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's the first thing that comes to my mind whenever yeah. I hear his name. Yeah. So I we were younger, not super engaged in politics when all of when these previous sure. presidencies happened. So but it's probably Bush not a fair Cheney was that's true. Yeah, you that you hear that it's got a ring to this it. Tag team. Yeah, for like, sure. When people talk about the Trump presidency, they're not going to talk about the Trump Pence administration. No, Pence was there hoping he would get impeached so he could become president. <laughs> yeah. I thoroughly believe that. Yeah. I thoroughly he believed. I sorry. I thoroughly believe that he thought there's no way this motherfucker going to make it four years. Four years. Yeah, <laughs> probably. This is my ticket. I don't think to anybody did. Right. I don't think anybody did. Um. So along these lines of speeches, uh, uh, wrapping up the, the, you know, glorious nature of all this, at least for us, um, you know, watching that speech for Joe Biden was perhaps the most impactful presidential, you know, presidential elect or whatever. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Acceptance speech I have ever heard. It was for someone, there's no way you can question his... (laughs) mental cognition I know there's just no way and I understand he stuttered a little bit here and there and because he has a stutter assholes right (laughs) assholes will nitpick on that but how could you not walk away from that speech after hearing it I had to fight tears watching that speech how do you watch it and not say that's how you're supposed to talk Mm -hmm. that is how you're supposed to lead you don't even have to agree with his politics right just listening to him the again and this is what i said when we were talking about this leading up to it that this isn't about the policies we are in a moment that's beyond your political leaning we are in a moment that requires empathy compassion humanity and leadership right and competency like that's like Step one, like that's what we need. (laughs) And they have the plans to back it up. And you may agree, you may or may not agree with all of the the specifics. But yeah, I I thought the same thing. That was, I think, the greatest speech of his his life. I did not expect that from him. I know. I think he, uh, yeah, I know. I think the only time that he, I think he only tripped up once. He misspoke, said the wrong word. He he said the wrong word. He instead of two hundred thirty thousand, he, he said, said million. Yeah, but yeah, but that was it. And then he stuttered one other time. The moment is heavy. Yeah, I get it. And it would have been. I said this to you. It would have been great if he came out on stage and said, "It's a big fucking deal." Yeah, I know. <laughs> I know. I just i I thought the same thing. I'm like, how all the people out there who are still saying Sleepy Joe, Dementia Joe, like living in his basement. Like, I I just, I don't even know what else to say about it. It was an impassioned, like articulate, just great speech. And it covered, it was exactly what we needed to hear right now. It yeah. was about unity, about moving forward, getting back to our basic values as Americans and trying to make our government work for the people like that is his message and let's get through this together and we're reminded tonight of those who fought so hard for so many years to make this happen once again america's bent the arc of the moral universe more toward justice kamala doug like it or not your family You become an honorary Biden, there's no way out. All those of you who volunteered and worked the polls in the middle of this pandemic, local elected officials, you deserve a special thanks from the entire nation. So I'm playing that for you because we're talking about how you phone banked and sent out letters and had people and recruited people for sending out letters and this must feel vindication yeah it's vindic it it, it's gotta be proof so gratifying (laughs) yeah it, it it's results yeah and it's to the states that you called too i know we're the ones pennsylvania and wisconsin yeah I sent a lot of letters to Florida too, but hey, (laughs) 
can't win them all. But yeah, I, I never, and this is one of the things that gives me hope. And what I was saying in the beginning is that I feel like people like me who got really, who got engaged, like I've always been a voter, but I've never been engaged. And I think there are so many people like me who have always cared, but never really understood how to get involved or they didn't think it really mattered or they didn't think that they were capable or whatever. And I think this election has opened up. It's just blown the roof off of volunteering and getting involved um, on a new level for so many people. Like I, um, the, the person who organized the letter writing to Pennsylvania told me that um, I was one of 450 people who wrote letters to those counties in Pennsylvania um, that ended up turning Pennsylvania. Um, 27,000 letters went to the count, not Philadelphia, but the other counties, right. Erie County, uh, Delaware County, a couple others. And it just, I'm like that 27,000 letters over 450 people in the grand scheme of how many people live in the country doesn't seem like a lot, but that really could have been what made the, yeah. you know, like that is mind blowing to me. And to hear him acknowledge that in his speech, and it really just feels like a, like, democracy at its best well this is grassroots this yes, is exactly, exactly what it is exactly and, you know it, it intuitively in 2020 that's not something that i would feel would be rather effective because when i get shit in the mail it's someone sent this to me to throw away yeah that's that's what junk mail is um but it just speaks to the relentlessness of people volunteering and really doing everything that they ca- they can and did to swing this, and I I don't mean that in sort of a uh, nefarious way. I mean that in terms of uh, what people are working for a goal, right? And it's not necessarily like persuasion. It's a lot of the involvement that I had was contacting disenfranchised voters right. who have met, been met with roadblocks, who want to vote, who want to have their voice heard and haven't been able to. Right. And their, the, their votes, the fact that they were able to turn out in the numbers that they did, people from these areas that have been suppressed for so long, that's the reason why we won. And It just goes to to me, on the one hand, that makes me so proud and so just relieved and happy that that was able to happen. But it wasn't without struggle. There were still people who waited in lines for 10, 12 hours, whatever, who had to take an entire day out of work, find childcare, whatever. It's basically there's still voter suppression that rises to the level of a a poll tax. Like if you have to miss a day of work, you're paying literally Mm -hmm. you're paying money to be able to exercise your right to vote. Yeah. And it's not equitable because some people don't, you know, sustain that loss and some people do. And that still saddens me that with as much effort that was put into this and the number of unprecedented, unprecedented number of people who got involved and campaigned, um, that it still was a slim margin in some places. It's like how many more people were still disenfranchised and not yeah. able to vote? And how much bigger would the blue wave have been if they were before we get into the final topic i do want to say that i in terms of future voting i do think this is now normalized Mm -hmm. i do think not only because of the pandemic that this was a godsend mail-in voting and early voting i just think it's there's something so much more fucking convenient about it and i i'm willing to bet people didn't know you could well i don't know if you always can i can always vote early they open in-person early voting uh, yeah. all the time? I, I thought so. so. I didn't know that either. And I thought the mail-in voting, I think normally you need a reason to like vote absentee. absentee yes. Ballot, yeah. This, because of the pandemic, I think many, if not well, all states, made it so that you normalized. didn't need a reason. Right, you didn't need a reason. You could just request a mail-in ballot. They and, should let that happen. Yeah, you know what else should be? Automatic voter registration. <laughs> like, if you want it. No, but... Why would like it's just like if you have a a social security number and you have a driver's license, you have your your, you know, whatever, like you your 
in the system in so many ways sure. already. Why aren't you in the system to vote when it's a basic right as sure. an American citizen? These are something, these are other things that need to be tackled and, and I have no doubt that they'll be addressed. I'm just saying in terms of the convenience and ease of voting mm -hmm. outside of an app because I don't trust technology right. and it will be hacked. Um, this this should be something we should see more of. Right. Well, it will and even allowed. in a non-pandemic, it will. Yes. Per right. But the, yeah, there's there's a reason why that's not happening. It's intentional. Before we scoot, I do want to talk about Trumpism and whether or not this is the end of it, because, you know, we, we're talking about the initial impact of all this. You have a, a subset of his voters that are still in denial that the co courts are going to do something and flip it back. His lack of tweeting in terms of the, the rapid pace that we're mm -hmm. used to seeing is, I think, a sign that even he knows yeah. it's, it's over. Um, there was photos of him driving back from the golf course where it was announced. Um, mm -hmm. or sorry, where he was when, when it was Joe announced. Biden yeah. was announced. And him seeing the sea of people happy that he's no longer president. literally dancing in the streets and <laughs> you just see even in other countries yeah you see just defeat on his face obviously this is going to be something that we're going to deal with in the immediate term wouldn't surprise me if on january 20th there are protests mm -hmm. for biden by his small yet vocal base of people that mm -hmm. think this is Stolen illegitimate. Election, yeah. Um, is this going to die? Because I'm sorry, and I know this might be, I'm using my words carefully, but you're on the wrong side of history, man, if you're going to fight through this. I know. And here's my hope. I'm trying to see the silver lining because it's been a hopeful weekend. <laughs> I haven't been able to find this type of an attitude very easily throughout the rest of this year. But um, right now I'm seeing, I think the last four years, Trump hasn't been necessarily the problem. I think he's been a symptom of a problem. And he's the dog whistle. Yeah. He's what exposed the problem. Like to just, to pick one example of systemic racism, like we have never talked about this like we are now. I think Biden even mentioned that in his speech. It's the first time those words have been uttered in a presidential speech. Um, and from that perspective, not to say that we should have to go through hell to be able to address an issue, but if nothing else, it's at the forefront and it's going to be at the forefront of the next administration. And it seems like we are finally, you know, ripe to to make progress on things like that that have been brought to the surface undeniably like it's it's widely accepted. Now, everybody finally sees it. This is a problem and we need to do something about it. And um, yeah, I think the people who are still in denial about it, who think that it's not a problem, who think that it's whatever un-american to address systemic racism i mean you just can't crawl back in your hole now though right if you were hardcore with the camp that said you know there is no such thing as racism in this country or you were one of those people that were behind build the wall get rid of these mexicans you can't walk that back now right and you don't have a leader that's going to reinforce that Right. So anymore. that's what I think is going to happen. I feel like it's just everyone, people who have felt. Um, but you've been exposed. Right. So I think they're going to try. I'm telling you, the, all but one of the houses in our neighborhoods that have been decked out with Trump stuff all year have taken their stuff down. Yeah. And part of me is like. Um, I had two thoughts. Either they take it down because the campaign's over. You know, you, you put your yard signs out for your candidate during the campaign and the election's over. So that means also they're admitting that it's over. And or they took them down to go to the, the rally with the other like 100 people. <laughs> like, I, I'm like, what'd you do somewhere, with all your stuff? Somewhere there's a vacant Walmart. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I just think that you can't undo this. No amount of I'm sorry tours. Are, is going to fix this for you. And this is what sucks for Trump because 
for someone that's so business savvy, quote unquote. Right. I'm glad you added that. For someone that, you know, and I do think he understands the the difference between long-term gains and immediate gains. Mm-hmm. He went for the immediate gains yeah. of going for, and I mean no disrespect to anybody, going for largely the uneducated, the, those without college educations, um, because we've and talked about this before. White. Sure. White it, it's college educated. Very, it, it's easier to get them on board with something without having to do research than those with college degrees, because I feel that in, you know, comparing the two just in a general sense, those with college degrees would say, no, this doesn't add up. Let me see where the disconnect is. Whereas those without college degrees generally will say, no, that makes sense. Let's go. Well, I think that, I mean, that's a part of it, I think, but you could say that about any misinformation, but. That's um, what I mean. Yeah. So my point is is that. But that's also, that's his base because they align with the, like when you're talking about like fossil fuel industry and, and they're, you know, the, the hardcore blue collar that's not even what I'm trying to get into. My right. point is, is that he went for the immediate gain and it gave him uh, his name in history. Legitimately, mm-hmm. he's was and was, will be former president of the United States. That can't be taken away from him. But he didn't go for the long term gain and understand that, you know, you have so much backlash in this country for the rhetoric that he produces that those that are educated buddy are the ones that write the fucking history books and i mean the history books that are that are used as textbooks in school that are utilized for educational purposes for the upbringing and generations of people from now on until eternity until america crumbles will look back at your presidency with disgust. They will see the racial injustice. They will see the Black Lives Matter parades and protests. They'll see the sea of people that marched for women's rights and how they outnumbered your fucking inauguration. They will see all this, and you will look, be looked at with disdain. And not only that, your children your children's children, your whole legacy of the Trump name is it's over because whether it's genuine or not, business partners, you're toxic now. Mm-hmm. You are not profitable because if, if there is a, a large scale business that is found out to be associated with the Trump name, they're risking their own livelihood. They're risking their potential financial gains because just because the name Trump, because it's become so toxic that people, if they see that you are affiliated with Trump, they will boycott that product. And now you have 70 some on million people that will boycott that product. I have a friend who wanted to get some yingling to celebrate when Pennsylvania flipped and someone told her that the yingling company is behind trump we don't know that well if it's um yes i don't want to put that out we don't know that okay fair enough my point is but it's a good example of right but that's what i'm saying like it's like you don't think about it but now people are thinking about it being conscious about it and trying to be more conscious about what businesses they support based on whether or not and don't get me wrong yeah he'll still have his old men friend that feel the same way as him Mm -hmm. make business dealings whatever sure but when he's gone and his children are left, and his children's children, unless they verbally denounce what he's done, their their opportunities are just going to be from just whatever's passed on. They're not going to have the same opportunity anymore. I know. And you know what I think a hardcore Trump supporter would say? Um. That should tell you everything you need to know. He's he put his ego aside. He put his legacy aside to to say what he meant and stand up for what yes, was right. Yes, but you're missing the point. What he he said, what he meant, and what he meant is the problem, not the fact that he said what he see, meant. 
Well, yeah. In Saying some what you mean is sometimes a good thing in yes. and of itself. That in a general sense. But it's what he said. I know. That's the problem. But there are people who disagree with you and think that what he's saying is right and good. And they commend him for you not being afraid to say ways. it. You can't say he says what he meant. And then when he says something blatantly racist, you say to us. Oh, but he didn't really mean he that. He didn't mean yeah. that. Oh, I know. I'm I'm, I'm playing devil's advocate here. I'm trying to put my my. You know, I, head I understand. In that space, My but. point is, is that he's. I feel Trumpism is something that's going to be present with us for at least in the immediate term. Yeah, a year, two years from now, when politics hopefully knock on desk are bo- is boring again. Yeah. I I well, don't that's the thing. I hope it doesn't. I mean, I do hope. It gets boring from that perspective. But like I said before, I think that people are like, I don't see myself not writing letters anymore. Sure. Like we'll as see. long. I mean, is the, if there's a I don't feel like it's going to feel like this desperate, like our entire future hinges on this election and right. I'm not going to stop writing letters for the next 30 days yeah. like I did this year. But like, I, I mean, I just I've gotten a taste of how easy it is to get involved and I don't see a reason to walk away from that now like i feel like the path has been opened that yes maybe politics will be will be more boring but i feel like people have avenues to stay engaged sure i will say this one of the biggest trump supporters i know work with him friday said how are you doing man you okay he said i think at heart people are good people and I need to stop watching the news and stop getting into politics. I need, wow. I need to, I need to be away from it. Yeah. And I said, yeah, yes, you do. I've been seeing a lot of that too, from mostly on social media people I know who support Trump who say, there's a lot of the whole like, let's just be kind to one another. Like, <laughs> we can disagree about politics and still be friends and. But some you of these should others, be able to. I agree. I agree. But these are some of the same people who have been posting some really vile shit the last few months. And now that their candidate lost and they're like kind of like have their I'm tail saying, between their can't legs. go back into right. the hole. But they're trying. And, part, and I do agree with that. Like I do think we should be kind first and foremost. But again, I said if this last week. If there's a week, political disagreement, of yes, course. Yes. But if you're spewing hatred yes. or you know you're saying racist things or you're just defending like complete like authoritarianism like i'm or defending white supremacy there's there's a serious problem there that's not disagreeing about politics and i will try to be kind i, I like i'm not gonna like try to I'm not gonna rear end you because you have <laughs> a trump bumper sticker on the on the road like right. i mean I want to function in a in a kind society, right. but if I'm faced with that type of a conversation or I see someone saying or doing something that's just morally wrong, right. I'm going to say something. I'm not saying we're going to, there's, yeah, I'm not going to meet it with hatred, but it's, you can't sweep that under the rug. No. And, you know, for me, time will tell how they're going to deal with that. And I know that seems anticlimactic, but... It's the facts. But to wrap this up, it's funny to me how now you're seeing some Trump supporters say, I'm going to move to Canada. Don't want to be in a socialist <laughs> country. And I'm like, buddy, gay marriage is legal. Yeah, good luck. <laughs> Free health care. Yeah. Pot is legal. You are in the wrong fucking destination. <laughs> because all the shit that, well, some of the shit or most of the shit politically that they're doing up there we're trying to get done here. It's the stuff you don't like yes. about the progressive agenda so, in the U.S. Don't recommend that. I yeah. Personally, I would recommend that. <laughs> you know, Canada is beautiful. But for your sake, you probably would enjoy it as and most hate to people admit do. It. And hate to admit exactly. that you enjoy it. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Shout out to Canada. <laughs> That's going to do it for today. Um, I think next week we're going to try to get some guests on the show. Is that the is that the goal? Oh, I don't. Are we? I'm up for it whenever, but you're the technical person. I think it's going. I well, I talked to them. Okay. Uh, next week. <laughs> uh, sorry, last week, and I think next week. All right. As long as we can get the the, tec- the technical stuff worked out. Yeah, yeah. we'll figure it out. Hopefully. That'll be fun. Anyways. Yeah. Uh, we appreciate you listening, and uh, we hope that 
you are satisfied with the results of the election. If you are or are not, we invite you to hit up our Facebook page, uh, facebook.com slash while she's napping. You can express your opinion when it comes to the election on the post for the show. The only thing we ask is that it's backed up in fact and data and not misinformation. Because if it is, we will delete it. Them be the rules. So if you say something like civil war is coming, delete. If you say something like the Democrats stole the election, delete. If you say I'm not happy that Trump lost, but I'm willing to give it a chance or fuck Biden, I I wanted Trump. That's all fine. Mm -hmm. But don't spread fear and misinformation. It will get deleted. Otherwise, have at it. Yeah, we're open to political conversation. That's what we've been talking about this whole time. If you are upset that um, Biden won and we have a Democratic ticket in the White House. Totally fine. Tell us and, and engage us in the conversation. Re, you know, revisit the other episodes we did in October. We touched on a few different topics um, like Second Amendment and political correctness. Like what are the things that you're you disagree with, like right. that you're nervous about? I mean, I'm we're totally open to having those actual political conversations but we're not going to add any fuel to the fire when it comes to misinformation or fear-mongering. That being said, you can hit us up, like I said, facebook.com slash while she's napping or on our Instagram page at while she's napping, uh, Twitter at she's napping pod, but we're, we're very lacking on yeah. Twitter. Uh, well, that's all you. I'm terrible so. at Twitter. <laughs> Anyways, uh, congratulations to all those that worked hard to make this a reality in their own way, whether it was phone banking or letter writing. I know you had a lot of recruits yes. that listened to the show. Uh, I'm grateful for it. Um, well, and you, you helped. I printed. Yes. And I am, <laughs> I'm very proud of you for Thank doing you. that. Um, you're a much better person than I am. So Stop. Um, no. Well, when it comes to that, not when it comes to fantasy football, but when it comes to that, <laughs> even though you beat me. Yeah. Uh-huh. Well, Anyways. Yeah. Side note. Until next week. <laughs> take care, guys. Bye.